Who's there? Who? David? Is that you? Answer me. Who are you? Look, if someone sent you here, I... No. No. Wait! Wait! All right, cut! Cut! Now, keep your positions, please. Ted, kill that fog. Max. Look, Max, he's got to recognize him before yeah. the shot. Derek, wait a minute. The fog is getting much too heavy. If I can make it through the cavalry. Mm. Max. Oh, Margo. I didn't know you were here. Oh, I just got here. They asked me to, uh, they told me yeah. to stand out of the way until the scene was over. Yeah. You want to get out a line of fire? Yes. I called you last night from the airport as soon as I arrived. Tony was on the line. Yes, he told me. I really didn't expect you over here this morning. I missed you. Well, I thought I'd better come over because... Matt, Do you have any trouble finding the plane? Uh, uh, there's something I have to tell you. Yeah? You see, uh, Tony still doesn't know about us. I never told him. He seemed to know who I was on the phone. Well, he knew that you were someone that I met at a party when you were here last year. And I said that you promised to look me up if you ever got back to London. And here I am. Yes, but the fact is, he's changed. He really has. He's stopped feeling sorry for himself about his tennis, and he's trying really hard to make a go of his new job. It's difficult to explain, Max, but he's everything now he wasn't before. He's caring and considerate, and he needs me. Max, he does. Hey, Max, we're breaking for lunch. Back at two. Right. I'm sorry. Well, it takes some getting used to. I know. Believe me, I know. Want have some lunch? No, I don't think we better. Sorry, Max. Well, I'd at least like to be able to call you, say goodbye before I leave London. There is one thing, Max. I, I don't even know if I really should tell you, but um, you remember those letters you wrote to me after you left? Of course. I burned them all, except one. You probably know the one I mean. I probably should have never written it. Oh, no. I'm so glad you did. I loved it. I used to carry it with me until the letter disappeared, along with my handbag at Victoria Station. The handbag was returned about two weeks later from Lost and Found, but the letter was gone. Then someone wrote me a note demanding money for me to get it back. 300 pounds or he'd show the letter to my husband. Did you send the money? Yes, but I didn't get the letter. You still have the blackmail note? Yes. I'd like to see it if I could. Well, that could be a bit uh, difficult, our meeting again. Why, is it at the apartment? Yes. Well, I'd like to see it. Tie up money and package and mail to John King, 23 Newport Street, Brixton SW9. You will get your letter back by return mail. Postmark Brixton. Hmm. That address turned out to be a little shop. People use it as a forwarding address. You went there? I waited two weeks for him to send me your letter. When nothing happened, I drove to the address. No one ever heard of a man by that name. And the package with my money in it was still there. It had never been opened. And well, you never told Tony about any of this? No. And I couldn't understand why the man didn't collect the money. He's probably in jail by then. Is that why you asked me to stop writing it? I was really in a panic. I imagined every letter you wrote me would be opened and read by someone. Why didn't you tell me? You couldn't have done anything. I figured it was better to just pay up and get it over with. Well, let's hope it is over with. Listen, you, you don't mind if I keep this for a while, do you? 
If you like. Margo. Last time I saw you, Tony was making your life pretty miserable. What happened? I really don't know. But it all started the night I came to say goodbye to you. Remember that night? Yeah. About every moment. I was fixing spaghetti and we were talking about having out with Tony. But we didn't. No. No, I came back that night, cried myself to sleep, right here on the sofa, but... When Tony came home that night, he said he was giving up tennis, no more tours, that he was taking a job with an American sporting goods company here in London, which he did. And ever since, he's been caring, reasonable, affectionate. And they lived happily ever after. I'm afraid your stories never end that way. I hope you believe me when I, when I say I'm glad yours did. Oh, yes, I know, but... This is uh, Max Halliday. Oh, how'd you do? Oh. Let's see, we've uh, we've talked on the telephone, haven't we? Yes, we did. You're the one who writes all those murder things. Guilty. <laughs> oh, the boss came in unexpectedly. Darling, hell to pay. Well, I see Margaret's been neglecting you. Let's have a drink. Oh, no, thanks. I've had one. Please. No? No. Darling? No, thank you. Oh. You live in New York? Yes. Work in uh, television? For my sins. Oh, too bad. Poor fellow. How do you do it? Do what? Well, think up all those murders. Oh, listen. Any and every way I can. Poison, suffocation, stabbing, the old reliable pistol. 43 murders since I saw you last year. Remarkable. Oh, not really. See, so I have these three old hats. So who hat, why hat, how hat. Why is the motive? I take fear and jealousy and revenge and put them in the Y hat and pick one out. <laughs> Sounds like sorting out the week's laundry. <laughs> That's about it. And just to prove that white hole makes things brighter. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Are you staying in London very long? No, actually, I'm just here for one show, but I'd love to stay on a while. Oh, we must show you around sometime. Just let us know. Thank you. Darling, we might take him to the tower. That sounds appropriate. I made that on the first tour. Oh, what a shame. I've always wanted to go myself. Is that right? <laughs> well, if you two will excuse me, a mountain of work here. We had it all night. Oh, don't forget, we have theater tickets tonight. Oh, no. You oh, darling. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just can't make it. The boss is flying to Brussels on Sunday. I simply have to have all this ready for him before he leaves. I was counting on it. Oh. Look here, wait a minute. I've got a great idea. Why don't you two go together? Oh, no, I... No, we I couldn't. Well, why not? Of not course to... you can. Are you free tonight? Yes. Well, that's settled then. Here are the tickets. And you can pick up Margot at, uh, what time, darling? But, uh, Tony, I really well, don't it's, think uh, it would... It's a 7 o'clock curtain. Make it 6.30 then. Then you can both have a bite to eat afterwards. Look here, I hope you don't mind, Matt. No, of course not. Good. We'll have you over to dinner sometime next week. I can bore you with some of my stories about professional oh, tennis. I love it. Do you play at all? Well, I play, but not very well. I was a better fan. You were great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Never quite good enough, I'm afraid. I got out of it in time, didn't I, darling? Look here, Max. If you really like tennis, uh, there's a get-together tomorrow night. A lot of American chaps playing all over the continent, and we're giving them a sort of farewell dinner. Would you care to join us? Love it. Well, a lot of pros and uh, former pros. It's a stag party, but I think, uh, I think you might be interested. Now, wait a minute. I thought you said you had a mountain of work to do. Oh, I'll get around to it somehow. I really can't miss this. You'll get a kick out of it, I promise oh, I look you. I forward to it. Do you have a dinner jacket? Well, I'll pick one up. Splendid. We don't even need a car. We can walk to the place from here. All right. Uh, Tony, don't you think we should discuss one evening at a time? You are absolutely right. Theater first, tonight. Well, see you at 6.30 then. Thank you. I'll see you later, Margo. Max? <laughs> Max. What was the last name? Halliday. Seems like a nice chap. Mm. He was here. Uh, a year ago. Right. Oh, darling. You're not angry with me, are you? Oh, of course not.
the devil! And a car drive into his own garage with some I'm idiot! I'm so sorry. I, I just wasn't thinking. I pulled away and... It's a damn fool trick. Well, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. You know, you ought to... Wait a minute. We met before. We have? Well, you ever... Do you play tennis? Well, not anymore. Professional tennis, I'm afraid, is a young man's game. Wendis. Tony Wendis. Oh, my God, someone remembers me. <laughs> I was assistant manager at Harrison's. Harrison's? You mean the old tennis club just beyond Dover? That's it. No, wait a minute. I think I... You're... Swan. Swan! How right, are Swan, you? of course. <laughs> well, well I don't... now I'm really embarrassed. <laughs> I, I hope there isn't any damage here. Oh, I don't see any. You know, this car... You are driving one of my favorite cars, you know. Thank you. Bentley R-Type. Oh, I'd give my eye teeth to have one of these. Okay, okay, you're not thinking of selling this, are you? Well, no, <laughs> the motor's in any kind of shape at all, you know, we might make a deal. Tip top, couldn't be better. I treat it like a baby. Well, can I have a look? Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful. You weren't joking. I told you. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, there was quite a scandal. Over there at Harrison's, wasn't there? Some money stolen? That's right. Yeah. Nearly 400 pounds. I left it in the cash box in the office in the morning it was gone. Still makes me swear to think of it. As I recall, the uh, caretaker took it. Huh? That's right. Poor old Harold. Oh, poor old Harold. Found the cash box in his backyard. But not the money. That's right. What are you doing with yourself these days? Oh, I deal in property now. Oh. Don't even follow tennis anymore. You? Oh, I'm in sports equipment. It's not all that lucrative, really, but my wife has some money of her own, thank God. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to put out 4,000 pounds for this car. Six. Uh, six, little boy. Well, uh, look here, Swan. What do you say we make a test drive over to my place and perhaps we can fix up a price and wind up this whole little transaction, huh? Suits me fine. May I? Well, what did I tell you? Smooth as silk, right? Oh, I can't deny it. You can afford it. People with money don't know how lucky they are. Me, I got to live on what I earn. Of course, you can still marry for money. Mm, maybe, if I felt like it. Some people make a business of that. I know. I did. <laughs> you mean that the girl you fell in love with happened to have some money of her own? No, I always intended to marry for money. Although I had to settle for something less than I'd hoped for. Putting it bluntly. Have I shocked you? Oh, no! I always admire a man who knows what he wants. <laughs> but to know what you're willing to pay for, that's the thing. I'm willing to pay a big price for what I want. Hmm, well, that's the kind of talk I like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> What's this then? <laughs> Take a look. Well, what do you know? There we are. I had no moustache then. No. My wife had that frame for me. Silver. Oh. She, she's an American, did, did I tell you that? Nothing quite like American money when they've got it. What? <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> well, well, I almost lost it. I mean, her, once. She got tired of all the tournaments and tried to persuade me to give up tennis and play husband instead. <laughs> so I'd simply go off to the matches without her. Huh? But one time, I had a hunch. So I didn't leave. I uh, packed a few things and drove off. And then I uh, parked the car about two streets away and walked back on my tracks. When she came out of the house, I took a taxi and uh, followed her. What happened? She'd met someone. He was living in a studio in Chelsea. I could see them through the window of the studio as he was cooking spaghetti over a gas ring. They didn't say very much. They just looked very natural together. Funny how you can tell when two people are in love. Well, I got very worried. What would happen if she left me? All these expensive tastes I'd acquired? Oh, I can't ever remember being so scared. Well, I stopped at a pub and had a few drinks and thought of all sorts of things. I thought of three different ways of killing him. I even thought of killing her. And that seemed a far more sensible idea. And just as I was working out how I'd do it, I suddenly saw something that completely changed my mind. 
So I came back here, and she was sitting exactly where you are, and I told her I was giving up tennis to settle down and look after her instead. And you have. Oh, yes. The boyfriend went back to New York, but uh, he wrote letters. She burned them all except one. That letter she kept switching from handbag to handbag. That letter became an obsession to me. I was determined to find out what was in it. And finally I did. You mean you stole it? Yes. I even wrote an anonymous note offering to sell it back. Why? Well, I, I thought it might make her come and tell me all about him, but it didn't. So I kept the letter. Why are you telling me all this? Because you're the only one I can trust. Anyway, that did it. Must have put the fear of God into them because the letter stopped. <laughs> it's funny to think that a year ago, I was sitting in that pub actually planning to murder her. And I might have done it if I hadn't seen something that changed my mind. Well, what did you see? I saw you. What was so special about that? The coincidence. You see, everybody at Harrison's knew perfectly well that you'd stolen that cash box. Some of us even knew that you'd been court-martialed in the army and had spent a year in prison. Well, Mr. Wendis, it's been very interesting hearing about your matrimonial affairs. I take it you won't be wanting the car after all. Captain Lesgate. That is your name now, isn't it? Well, don't you want me to tell you why I brought you here? Yes, I think you'd better. When I saw you in the pub, everything became quite clear to me. Margot's will would leave me a great deal of money, but how to get at it? When the police would be bound to suspect me, I had to have an alibi. And then I saw you. I often wondered what happened to people who come out of prison. People like you, I mean, do they have any friends? Can they get jobs? I was so curious that I followed you home one night. Would you mind handing me that glass? Thank you. And the truth is, I've been following you ever since. Why? I was hoping that uh, sooner or later I might be able to catch you at something and be able to... Uh, Blackmail me. Influence you. After a few weeks, I got to know your routine, which made things a lot easier. Rather dull work? Or oh, to begin with, yes, but you know how it is. You take up a hobby and the more you get to know it, the more fascinating it becomes. You uh, became quite fascinating. Dog racing on Mondays and Thursdays, and you changed your name to Lesgate, and you're still using that name? I like it. Then you became somewhat richer after a brief encounter with a Miss Wallace. Dear Miss Wallace, she certainly was in love with you, wasn't she? I say, old man, if you want another drink, would you mind putting on these gloves? Uh, where were we? Ah, yes, poor Miss Wallace. I gather she must have thought you'd grown that handsome moustache of yours just to please her. Tell me, whatever happened to her, do you suppose? Where's the nearest police station? Opposite the church, about two minutes' walk from here. Suppose I walk there right now. What would you tell them? Everything. Everything? All about the activities of Captain Lesgate? I'd tell them you've been trying to blackmail me. Into? Murdering your wife. Ah, I almost wish you would. When she heard that, we'd have the best laugh of our lives. Indeed. Haven't you forgotten something? What? You told me quite a few things this evening. How you followed her to that studio in Chelsea, saw them cooking spaghetti and all that rubbish. Wouldn't that ring a bell? Oh, it certainly would. They'd assume you followed her there yourself. Me? Why? Well, why... Should you steal her handbag? Why would you write all those blackmail notes? Can you prove that you didn't? You certainly can't prove that I did. It would be a straight case of your word against mine. 
What could you possibly say? Well, I shall tell them that you came here tonight half drunk and tried to borrow some money. When I refused, you told me something about a letter belonging to my wife. As far as I could make out, you were offering to sell it to me. I gave you what money I had, and then you gave me the letter. It has your fingerprints on it, remember? And then you said that if I went to the police, you'd tell them some crazy story about my wanting to murder my wife. <laughs> Ridiculous. And we mustn't forget, we must never forget poor Miss Wallace. How careful you were not to be seen around with her, meeting her in all those out-of-the-way places. You're smart, aren't you? Not really. But I'm afraid you're quite wasting your time. After all, I'm offering you 5,000 pounds. For a murder? For a few minutes' work, that's all it is, I guarantee. That ought to appeal to you. You've been skating on very thin ice. I really don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, you should, you know. It's been in all the papers. A middle-aged woman found dead. Drug overdose, they said. No one knew where she got it. But we know, don't we, Lesgate? Don't we? Swan. We know. Take a long vacation. It makes a difference having money in your pocket. Where is it? The money? In a small attache case in the check room. Where? Somewhere in London. Of course, we don't meet again. As soon as you've delivered the goods, I will mail you the check room ticket and the key to the case. You can take this 500 pounds on account. Oh, come on, old man. The police would only have to trace one of those notes back to you. They'd hang us from the same rope. Ah, no. You see, I've been cashing an extra hundred pounds a week for a whole year, always changing them into five-pound notes at my leisure. Simple? When would all this take place? Tomorrow night. Oh, no, not a chance. I've got to think this over. It has to be tomorrow. I've arranged things that way. Where? Approximately where you're standing now. stag party at the Hotel Grendon, just down the street from here. She will go to bed early, turn out the lights, and watch the Saturday night theater on television. She always does when we're at home. At exactly 23 minutes to 11, you will enter the house by the street door. You will find the key to this door under the stair carpet out here. When you come through the doorway here, you will go straight to that doorway leading to the garden and hide behind these curtains. At exactly 20 minutes to 11, I will go to the telephone in the hotel and call my boss. I will dial the wrong number, this number. That's all I'll do. And when the phone rings, you will see a light go on under the bedroom door there. When my wife opens it, the light will stream across the room, so don't move until she answers the phone. There must be as little noise as possible. When you've finished, pick up the telephone and give me a soft whistle. Don't speak, whatever you do, I won't say a word. When I hear your whistle, I will hang up and redial the correct number this time. I will talk to my boss as if nothing had happened and go back to the party. What happens then? Go on. You will find this suitcase here. It will contain some clothes of mine for the cleaners. Open it and tip the clothes out onto the floor. Then fill it with that cigarette box and some of those trophies. Close the lid, but don't snap the lock. And then leave it here, just as it is now. As if I left in a hurry. That's the idea. Now, the French doors to the garden. If they're locked, unlock them and leave them open. And then go out exactly the same way you came in. By this door? 
Yes, and this is the most important thing. As you go out, return the key to the place where you found it. Under the stair carpet? Good man. I don't get it. Well, they think you'd come in by the rear garden. You thought the flat was empty, so you took the suitcase and went to work. My wife heard something and switched on the light. When you saw the light go on under her bedroom door, you hid behind the curtains. When she came in here, you attacked her before she could scream. And then, when you realized you'd actually killed her, you panicked and bolted into the garden, leaving the loot behind. Just a minute. I'm supposed to have entered by those French doors. What if they had been locked? Ah, well, that wouldn't matter. You see, my wife often takes walks around the garden before she goes to bed, and she usually forgets to lock up when she comes back in. And that's what I'll tell the police. Uh, yes, but she might say... She that... isn't going to say anything, is she? Is there any reason why I shouldn't just leave by the garden? Yes, you'd have to climb an iron gate. If anyone saw you, you might be followed. All right. I leave the flat. Put the key back under the stair carpet. Go out by the street door. Suppose the street door's locked. How do I get in in the first place? The street door is never locked. When will you get back? About 12. I shall bring back Halliday with me for a nightcap. So we will find her together. And we'll have been together ever since we left her. And there's my alibi. You've forgotten something. What? When you return with, what's his name, Halliday, how will you get into the apartment? I let myself in. But your key will be under the stair carpet. He's bound to see you take it out, and that will give the whole show away. No. It won't be my key under the carpet. It'll be hers. I will take it from her handbag and hide it out there, just before I leave. She won't be going out, so she won't miss it. And when I come back with Halliday, I will use my own key to let us in. And then when he's searching the garden or something, I will take her key from under the stair carpet and return it to her handbag before the police arrive. How many keys are there to that door? Just hers and mine. <laughs> Made available 401. Hi, Tony. It's me, Margot. Well, hello, darling. How's it going? Play. We're enjoying every minute of it. Just a minute, darling. I think there's someone at the front door. Careful. Have you seen on the street from the bedroom window? Sorry, darling. False alarm. How are you? I'm pretty sleepy. Just made myself some coffee to try and keep awake. Well, I was hoping you could join us now. Oh, afraid not, darling. We'll make it some other evening soon. Would you mind very much if we did go have a bite to eat before we come home? Of course I don't mind. Look, uh, take him to Jerry's. He's a wonderful chef. There goes the bell for the last act. You gotta go. Bye. All right, darling. Bye, love. Enjoy yourself. in the bloody cup at Melbourne. And the, and, and the one I wanted to show you. Darling, where, where's that picture of me with a Maharaja? Oh, uh, it's here someplace with the loose ones. I do wish you'd find the time to finish pasting these things well, in. Oh, I will. One of these days. Oh, oh yes, here we are, Max. Look, <laughs> there, there he is. <laughs> in the blue and white headdresses. Oh, yeah. He had four Rolls Royces and enough jewels to sink a damn battleship, and all he really wanted to do was play at Wimbledon. You really ought to write a book about this, Tom. Oh. Why don't you two collaborate? A detective story with a tennis background. Murder on the center court. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> what about it, Max? Would you provide me with the perfect murder? Oh, nothing I'd like better. Tell me, how do you, how do you start to write a detective story? I just forget about the detection entirely and concentrate on the crime. The crime's the thing. <laughs> Just imagine I'm going to steal something or murder somebody. Is that how you do it? That's fascinating. 
Yeah. I just put myself in the murderer's shoes and say, what do I do next? Do you believe in the perfect murder? Absolutely. On paper. I think I could plan one better than most people. I don't think I could carry it out. Why not? Well, in stories, you know, it always ends the way the author wants it to. In real life, it's not like that. I imagine my murders would be much like my bridge. Make some damn stupid mistake when realize that everybody's staring at me. <laughs> oh, dear, I think it's gonna rain. Uh, let's have one more for the... Oh, damn, it's empty. I'll be right back. Don't anybody move. I guess we better shove off. What do you say, Max? Yeah, fine with me. I'll lock up. Oh, darling, would you get Max's coat for him? Certainly. Well, if you two don't get drenched. Oh, uh, we'll beat the darn poor with any luck. You have your key, darling. My key? Of course. Oh, I just wanted to be sure, in case I decide to go out. Tonight? Yes. I thought I'd go to a movie or something. I thought you were going to see the Saturday Night Theater on television. No, thank you. The listing says it's a thriller, and I hate watching thrillers when I'm home alone. I see. Well, what's the matter? Uh, I'm sorry about this, Max, but I guess we'd better not go. What? What do you mean? Oh, look, darling, it's going to come pouring down, and you're going to get absolutely soaked. Tony, are you trying to make me stay home? You know how I hate doing nothing. Nothing? There are hundreds of things you can do. Have you written to Peggy about last weekend? And then what about these clippings? It's an ideal opportunity. Tony, I just don't think well, I, I think I'd better phone the hotel and tell them we're not coming. Let's not be childish about it. If it's really that important to you, I'll do your clipping. I'm not forcing you to. No. <laughs> You're an angel. Sometimes. If the boss calls, I'll be at the Hotel Grandin. All right, what's the number? Uh, it's in the book, on our desk. Look after each other. Oh, yeah, we will. Come on, Max. Thanks, Mark. Suspect aging bow boy. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. Anyway, the rain came down, stopped play, so he went back into the locker room. Tommy got had a few belts and got squiffed. Took so long for them to resume play that Tommy had time to sober up, and when he got back on the court, he was so hungover, he lost the match. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, you, do you play tennis at all, Mr. Halliday? Oh, yeah, I play so badly the moment I step on the court, I get laughs. <laughs>
<laughs> so you've been writing books for long, Mr. Halliday? For about 15 years, the last 10 or 8 mysteries. I see. Does anybody have the time? Yep. 20 minutes to 11. Forgive me, I've got to call my boss. It's me. Oh, thank God. Tony, come home right away. What's the matter? I, I can't explain now. Just, just please hurry. Darling, will you pull yourself together? A man attacked me, tried to strangle me. Has he gone? No, he's dead. Tony. Tony, are you still there? Tony? Margo. Oh, yes. Now, now listen very, very carefully. Yes, I'm listening. I'll be with you in a minute. Don't touch anything and don't speak to anybody until I get back. Just please hurry. Please, quickly. Something around my neck. I think huh? it was a stocking. Are you sure? Let, let me see. When he fell, he must have driven those scissors right into himself. It's horrible. Can't you cover it? Yeah, yeah, right away. What are you doing? 
Oh, could you get me some water, please? you close the garden doors, please? No, no, we mustn't touch anything until the police get here. Must have, must have broken in. Wonder what he was after. Those silver cups, I expect. When will the police get here? Have you called them already? No, you told me not to speak to anyone. Hadn't you better call them? Yes, in a minute. I'll get dressed. Why? But they want to see me. They're not going to see you. They'll have to ask me questions. Well, they can wait until tomorrow. I'll tell them all they need to know tonight. But Tony. Yes? Why did you call me? What? Uh, I will uh, I'll tell you all about that later. Just thought of something. You said he used a stocking. I think it was a stocking or a scarf, isn't it there? No. Well, I expect they'll find it somehow. Get back to bed. Come on. Get back to bed. I'll tell the police. Right away. I told him to go straight home. Uh, hello, operator, could you get me the maid of ill police quickly? Did you tell him? Well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure what had happened. I, I, I just said I was feeling lousy. That's all, darling. Would you please go back to bed? Sergeant Pearson. Uh, look, police, this, there's been a terrible accident. So what sort of accident? A man has been killed. Your name, sir? I'm Tony Wendis. I'm at 61A Charrington Gardens, ground floor flat. And when was this accident? About two minutes ago. He, he, he must have broke in and he attacked my wife. A burglar? Yes, I'll, I'll explain all this to you when you get here. How long do you think that'll be? About two minutes. Um, look, don't touch anything, will you, sir? No, no, of course. We won't touch anything, thank you. yourself up to a lot of questions, huh? Oh, there, there is uh, one other thing. The, the sergeant uh, wants to know why you didn't phone the police immediately. But how could I? You were on the phone. I, I know that. But you distinctly told me not to speak to anyone until you got here. I know that, but I told him a slightly different story. Why? Well, I told him that you hadn't phoned the police because you naturally assumed I would call them from the hotel. But why would you say that? Because it was perfectly logical and he accepted it. You see, if they got the idea, even for a few minutes, that we delayed reporting it, they might get nosy and ask a lot of questions. So you want me to say the same thing? I think so, yes. I'm awfully shaky. Would you get me a drink, please, Tony? Uh, yes, of course, darling. Tony? What 
a minute, darling. Inspector Hubbard of the Criminal Investigation Division. <clears throat> yes, I thought uh, we'd already given your sergeant all the necessary information. Yes, yes, of course. I've seen his report, but there are just a few things I'd like to get first hand, if you don't mind. I see. Please, come in, Mrs. Mendes. I'm sorry to inconvenience you. Uh, I know what a shock this must be to you. Please, sit down. Thank you. Uh, can I get you any cup of, uh, cup of tea? No. No, no, no. Uh, that was a very nasty experience you had, Mrs. Mendes. Apparently, this, uh, uh, <coughs> this burglar broke in by the back garden. I, I really don't know. Where were you, Mr. Wendis? I was at a dinner party just down the road. And by some curious coincidence, I was actually phoning my wife when she was attacked. So I got her. Uh, could you tell me the exact time of that? I'm not sure. Did you notice Mrs. Wendis? Mm, no, I didn't. You phoned the police at three minutes to eleven, sir. Ah. Well, in that case, it must have been about uh, quarter to eleven. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea yet who it was? Oh, yes. Yes, well, we've discovered where he lived. There seems to be some confusion as to his real name. Um, have you ever seen the man before, Mrs. Wendis? What? Why not? Of course not. Would you mind walking over here a minute? Is this the man? Yeah. You don't recognize him? I never saw him. Didn't you even get a glimpse of his face last night? No. Uh, you see, he attacked me from behind and it was dark and I, I hardly saw him at all. <laughs> Before I showed you these photographs, you said you'd never seen him before. How could you know that if you didn't see him last night? I, must, I, don't, I don't understand. Inspector, my wife simply meant that as far as she knew, she'd never seen him before. Was that what you meant? Yes, yes. I'm sorry. And what about you, Mr. Wendis? You ever seen him before? No. That is... Huh? Well, he's very like someone I used to know at a tennis club. Uh, moustache makes a difference, though. What was his name? Oh, now you're asking. Let me see. Um, was it Lesgate? No. What about Swan? No. Wait a minute. Swan. 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 Yes, that's it. In fact, I'm quite sure. Indeed, I have a picture of him at home with some of my tennis trophies. Oh, he played tennis? No, 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 he just worked at the club. Have you met him since then? No. Wait a minute, I did, come to think of it, I did see him quite recently, not to speak to. When was that? About six months ago in a railway station. Waterloo, I think. I remember noticing how little he changed. And he got a moustache then? No. Hmm. I'm very sorry to trouble you, but in view of what you've just told me, I, I would like to have a look at that flat of yours. You mean now? Well, yes, if you don't mind, please. Inspector, my wife is still... Oh, there. yes, yes, I know. But uh, could be of great help to us, Mrs. Wendis. May we? Yes, of course. It's still quite wet out here. Now, you were standing... Excuse me, Mrs. Wendis. 
You were standing over by the dusk last night when it happened? Yes. Could you show me exactly where? The lights in here, were they on or off? Off. Oh, I came in from the bedroom, and I stood here and picked up the phone. Are you sure you were standing with your back to the garden doors there? Yes. But why? Why not? Huh. Why go around the desk? I'd have picked it up from here. Surely my wife can remember us, but just a moment, sir. Well, I always answer the phone from here. Why? Be if I want to write anything down, I'm holding the phone with my left hand. I see. All right. Go on. Go on? Tell me what happened after you picked up the phone. Oh, well, he must have come from behind the... Uh, curtain by these doors and attacked me. He got something around my neck. Something? What do you mean by something? I think it was a stocking. What happened then? He pushed me down on the desk and I distinctly remember feeling for the scissors. What are those scissors usually kept? Uh, in one of these drawers. I had forgot to put them away. Uh-huh. What makes you think he came from behind these curtains? Where else could he have been? The curtains were drawn, I suppose? Yes, they were. You draw them yourself? I drew them, Inspector, before I went out. You locked the door at the same time? Yes. Quite sure of that? Perfectly sure. I always lock up before I draw the curtains. Then how do you suppose he got into this room? We assume that he broke in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no sign of a break-in. They... The lock is quite undamaged. But he must have. When I came back, that door was wide open. Unless, at least, Margot, are you sure you didn't go out into the garden last night and forget to lock up afterwards? Well, we were all out there before you left. Yes, I know. But I locked up when we came back in. No. Oh. Wait a minute. I did go out. Yes, just for a moment. After he attacked me, I, w I felt quite ill, and I wanted some air. I, I opened the door and stood outside just for a moment. Oh, you pushed the door open? Yes. You're sure you didn't unlock it first? Yes, quite sure. Did you call for help out there? No, I had just spoken to my husband on the phone. Mrs. Wendis, why didn't you ring the police immediately this happened? I, um, was trying to get through to the police when I discovered my husband was on the line. I naturally thought that he would call the police from the hotel before he came here. Did it occur to you to send for a doctor? No. Why ever not? Well, the man was dead. How did you know that? Well, it, it, was, it was obvious. Well, you feel his pulse? No, of course not. Anyone could tell he was dead. One look at those staring eyes. Yeah, uh, so you did see his face after all? I... I saw his... Eyes, I can't remember his face. Inspector, my wife has obviously never seen this man before. And if he didn't get in by the garden, how did he get in? As a matter of fact, we are quite certain that he came in through this door. But it was locked. Margot, did you open this door at all and forget to close it after we left? No. Oh. How many keys are there to this door? Only two. Mine was in my handbag, and you had yours yeah, with you. Yeah, that's right. Does the caretaker have a key? No. Do you employ a charwoman? Yes, but she doesn't have one either. I, I'm always here when she comes What in. makes you think he came in that way? His shoes. His shoes? The ground was soaking wet last night. If he'd come in by the garden, he'd have left marks all over the carpet. He didn't leave any because he wiped his shoes on the front door mat. How can you tell? It's a fairly new mat, and some of the fibers came off on his shoes. Oh, it's special. And there was a small tar stain on the mat, and some of the fibers show that, too. There's no question about it. Wait a minute. I think I've got it. Do you remember when your bag was stolen? Yes. Wasn't your key inside it? Yes, but it was still there when I got it back. 
Just a minute. I'd like to hear about this. What sort of a bag? Oh, it's a handbag, Inspector. My wife lost it at Victoria Station. But I got it back two weeks later from the lost and found. Was anything missing? All the money was gone. Anything else? No. Are you quite sure about that? Yes. And your latchkey was in the handbag when you lost it. Yes, but it was still there when I, the bag was returned. Yes. So whoever stole that money could have had the key copied. And where was the bag found eventually? At Victoria Station. But that was several days later, by which time he could have had a duplicate made and returned the original to the bag. And before you go any further with this, tell me, <clears throat> how did he get in through the street door out there? Well, the street door is always unlocked. I see. So he could have had your key copied, and he could have used it to unlock this door. But, of course, he didn't. Why not? Because if he had, the key would still have been on him when he died. But no key was found when we went through his pockets. I see. Well, it looks like we're back where we started. Uh, well, not quite. Um, Mr. Wendis, you say that you saw this man at Waterloo Station. Yes. Now, are you quite certain it wasn't Victoria Station? It may have been. Uh, when did you lose your handbag, darling? Was it that weekend we spent with Peggy? Yes, it was. It, it was, Victoria. I remember now. He was, he was in the restaurant when I saw him. No. And that was where you lost your handbag? Yes, yes, no, it was. I... Of course, you were with me. No, Tony... Didn't I say something about I, there's someone I, I, I know? I, I don't remember. It looks as though he may have had something to do with his handbag after all. Oh, the first thing to do is get all this down on paper. Excuse me. Oh, uh, Tony, I hope I'm not intruding. Hello, Max. Uh, Max, this is uh, Inspector Hubbard. Uh, Inspector, this is Mr. Halliday. He, he was uh, with me last night. Ah, uh, Mr. Halliday, you may help? be able to help us here. As you were with Mr. Wendis, uh, did you perhaps notice what time it was when he went to the phone? Yes, it was 20 minutes to 11. And uh, how did you come to notice that? Well, when Tony left the table, he asked me what time it was, and I looked at my watch. Thank you, because, you see, it was when Mrs. Wendis answered the phone that she was attacked. You were talking to Margot when it happened? Uh, yes. Is that when you told us you were calling your boss? What? Tony, I know what I wanted to ask you. Why did you phone me last night? Um, I had to. But why? Because I couldn't remember my boss's number. I rang you so that you could look it up in the address book, on the desk. Oh, so you got me out of bed just to get his number? I'm afraid so, darling, yes. You see, Inspector, my boss is flying to Brussels this morning. And there was something I wanted to remind him of that was rather important. But wasn't there a telephone directory in the hotel? Yes, but he was at home and his home number isn't listed. So you never called him after all? Well, when I heard what had happened here, I quite naturally forgot about it. Yes, I see. I would like you both to come and make an official statement before the inquest. And I think it's best to get it over with right away. Oh, look here, Inspector. We can't spend the entire day going back and forth. Oh, oh I don't blame you, sir. It is terribly inconvenient, I know. I'll get my coat. I don't know what all that's about. Could I have your address, sir? I may need to get in touch with you. Yeah, sure. The uh, Carfax Hotel. Yes, sir. Would you be right. good enough to write it down for me? Yep. Thank you. And the uh, telephone number as well. All right. Ever been in London before, sir? Yes, I was here a year ago. Mm -hmm. Inspector. There's a crowd of people out there. Can't you send them away or something? Oh, they'll come back faster than they go, sir. I was going to suggest we left by the garden. Isn't, isn't there a gate down there at the bottom? Yes, but it may be locked. Well, I'll, I'll just sit down. How much does he know about you and Mrs. Wendis? What? You wrote Mrs. Wendis a letter from New York. It was found in the dead man's inside pocket. I didn't mention it because I didn't know how much he knew. Have you any idea how it got there? No. Where's Tony? Oh, he's, uh, he's 
in the garden. Mrs. Wendis, when you lost your handbag, you lost a letter as well, didn't you? No. Margot, it was found in the dead man's pocket. You did lose it, didn't you? Yes, I did. I asked you that before, didn't I? Yes, but you see, my husband didn't know about it. This man was blackmailing you, wasn't he? Tony has to know. No. It's the only way. Max. Spectre, not long after Mrs. Windus lost my letter, she received this note. Last February. How often have you seen this man? I've never seen him. Mrs. Wendis, I must warn you that you will have to make a statement in front of other police officers that anything you say will be taken down and used in evidence. Now then, never mind what you've told me so far. We'll forget all about that. I want the truth. I want to know exactly what happened here last night. And if you try to conceal anything at all, it may put you in a very serious position. I wish you would explain what, what all of this means. I will. You admit that you killed this man. You say that you did it in self-defense, yet you admit that he was blackmailing you. Blackmailing? I have to tell you, Mr. Wendis, that your wife was having an affair with Mr. Halliday. No. It's true, Tony. I should have told you a long time ago. Sorry. But you can't believe for one minute, Inspector, that Mrs. Wendis deliberately killed this man. There were no witnesses. We've only got her word for it. No. No, I'm sorry. This is very difficult for me. But my wife is innocent. I heard it all. I heard it on the telephone. What exactly did you hear? A sound of some kind of sort of thud. Did you hear anything to indicate a struggle? Huh. You see, all you really know is what your wife told you, isn't that true? You said that he came in through these garden doors, and we know that he came in over there. No, that door was locked. Wait a minute. There are only two keys. My husband had his with him, and mine was in my handbag here. You could have let him in. Oh. Are you suggesting that she let him in herself? It appears to be the only way he could have entered. Don't you even believe that I was attacked? How do you think I got these bruises on my neck? You could have caused the bruises yourself. How? We found a nylon stocking with a knot in it. That must be what he used. The stocking was discovered in one of those silver cups up there. And the match to it was in the top dresser drawer in your bedroom. No. This stocking was yours. No! I've had enough. I've heard of the police deliberately planting clues to make certain of a conviction. I didn't realize it happened in this country. They were here over two hours. They could have taken that stocking and done anything with it. Of course they did. And they wiped his shoes on the doormat as well. Hello, Roger. It's Tony Wenders. There was a burglary here last night, Roger, and Margot was attacked. No, she, she's perfectly all right, thank you, but the man was killed. The police are here now, and don't laugh, but they're suggesting that Margot killed him intentionally. Oh, I wouldn't have said that if I were you, sir. Yes, it is funny, isn't it? Can you come over straight away to the Maidavale police station? Thank you, Roger. All right, darling. Roger's coming to the station. Mr. Wendis, may I advise you... Our lawyer will give us all the advice we need. Thank you. Margo. Mr. Wendis? Oh, yes, of course. I just wondered.
Yes, I, I, I just found out. It's the Home Secretary. He claims that there aren't sufficient grounds to recommend a reprieve. Indeed, I'll try not to give up hope. Thank you, Ron. didn't come around before because I wasn't sure how you felt after that. Oh, that's all right. I've hardly seen anyone for weeks. I moved out here because uh, everybody stops in the street and peers in at the bedroom window. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they started climbing through the garden. Anything I can do? I'm afraid it's all been settled. We've done all we can. Have we? You'd do anything to save Margot's life, wouldn't you, Tony? Of course. Even if it meant going to prison several years yourself? I'd do absolutely anything. But I think there's something we can do if you tell the police the right story. The right story? I've been working this out. You go to the police and you tell them you hired this man to murder your wife. What are you talking about? Listen. I've been writing this stuff for years. I know what I'm talking about. Sit down. Now that the man is dead, you can say anything you like. You can say you worked out the whole thing together. That you never saw him at Victoria Station. It was an invention of yours, just to connect him with the letter. But the letter was found in the dead man's pocket. Because you put it there. You found out who was writing to her, and you were so devastated that you just went over the edge. No, they, they take it exactly with what it is. A husband desperately trying to save his wife. So where's a try, Tony? We've got to do something. Tomorrow's the execution. Look, look, if there's the slightest chance of this coming off, of course I'd do it, but it has to be convincing. I mean, whatever story I tell the police, you'll have to come with me. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. They know the kind of stuff I write. If they suspected we'd talk, they wouldn't listen. Good afternoon, Mr. Wenders. Is uh, this about my wife? No. No, I'm afraid not. May I? What is it, then? Oh, it's uh, just a question or two. I'm making some inquiries into a burglary that took place some oh, three well, weeks ago. Just can't this wait just a few more days, Inspector? Oh, uh, believe me, sir, I do fully appreciate your position. If I may, I, I would like to say how deeply sorry yeah, I am. It's all right, all right, isn't it? Thank you, thank you, Inspector. How can I help? Um, we've been on the lookout for an embezzler, sir, who recently met off with several hundred pounds. And in uh, checking with the Wales garage, is that right? Uh, we note that you settled an account there recently for 200 pounds. Yeah. Uh, you paid in cash. Yes, I happened to have rough, quite a lot of money on me at the time. Well, you just come from your bank, sir? Have you been to my bank, Inspector? Well, as a matter of fact, I have, yes. <laughs> it wouldn't help me very much, though. Bank statements always jealously guarded. Yes, yes. Where did you get it, sir? 
Is that any of your business? Well, uh, yes, if it's stolen money, it's very much my business. You see, if you got that money from somebody you didn't know, that might be the very person we've been looking for. Oh, hello. Is that yours, sir? Well, what is it? There's a latchkey lying on the floor here. No, all right. No, I've got mine right here. Hi. Oh, no. Not yours. Oh, must be mine, then. Oh, hmm. Look at that, sir. You've got a hole right through my pocket. <laughs> That's the worst of these latch keys. They all look alike, don't they? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. You were saying? Uh, I, I don't think I was. No. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, the, the money, yes. Um, would you mind telling me where you got it, sir? 300 pounds is rather a lot to be going about with. I thought, I thought you said 200 pounds a moment ago. Did I? Well, yes, you're quite right. I did. Um, yes. Yes, my sergeant said that you also paid a tailor's bill and a wine shop in cash. Well, that's easily explained. I simply won rather a large amount at the dog races. Well, you mean several hundred pounds? Yes. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me straight away? Well, because I, I was a little ashamed to be caught going to the dog races when my wife is under sentence of death. I understand, sir. It keeps your mind off things. I'm, I'm very, very sorry to no. have to Come and no, bother right. you like this. That's all right. so, oh, yeah, there was just one other thing, sir. Um, do you happen to have got a small blue attache case? Don't say you found that already. Why, have you lost it? Yes. I, I was going to report it this afternoon. I, I left it in a taxi. Oh. How do you know about that attaché case, Inspector? Oh, the wine shop noticed it when you paid your bill. As a matter of fact, the tailor in the garage remembered it, too. That's remarkable. You say I use it instead of a briefcase. Ah, oh, well, these taxi men are pretty good at handing things in. I hope you get it back. All oh, right. Is this what you're looking for, Inspector? Well, Mr. Halliday. Where, where did you find the a key, Tony? You've gone mad. Find some way to open it. Yeah, no, wait, just a minute, sir. Yeah, why did you tell me you'd left it in the taxi? Well, I, I, I thought I had. You see, I have two small attaché cases, Inspector, and, and one of them, the one I th thought we were talking about, don't be a fool. Max! I've got a key somewhere. What the hell is all this? Get to another one. Must be more than 3,000 pounds there. Where did you get it, sir? I can tell you why he got it. This is the money that had been paid Swan after he murdered Margot in this room. But as we all know, there was an accident. So he didn't have to pay Swan after all. And he's been living on it ever since. Well, Mr. Wendis? What's the matter, Tony? Just a little while ago, you said you'd do anything to save Margot's life. What changed your mind? Would you believe this, Inspector? But before you arrived, he was trying to get me to go to the police and tell them the most fantastic story about my bribing Swan to murder my wife so that I could inherit her money. Supposedly, I was the one who stole Max's letter and wrote the blackmail notes. You did? There, you see. Well, what else have you got, Max? Anything at all? told Swan he could hide his key out here somewhere. Probably on this ledge. Swan let himself in. Then he hid behind the curtains. And when Tony phoned Margot from the hotel, that brought her to the phone. <laughs> Just a minute. If Swan had used Mr. Wendis's key, it would still have been on him when he died. And besides, how did Mr. Wendis get in when he returned from the hotel? Margot could have let him in. Then Tony took the key from Swan's pocket before the police arrived. I, yes, but he let himself in with his own key. That was established at the trial, don't you remember? Come on, Max. Your move. Swan could have taken the key from the ledge and put it back on the ledge before he entered. 
be at all right. It's all very interesting, Mr. Halliday, but it doesn't get me any nearer to what I came this to This is find a matter of life and death, Inspector. What else matters? What matters to me is how Mr. Wendis got this money. That's all I'm interested in. Now, Mr. Wendis. I don't think Max is going to like this. If you want the truth, you can have it. When Margot called me back from the party that night, I found her kneeling beside Swan. She was going through his pockets. She kept saying that he had something of hers and she couldn't find it. She was almost hysterical and that's why I wouldn't let the police question her. Anyway, she showed me this money and she said, if anything should happen to me, don't let them find this. Well, I took the money to Charing Cross Station and I left it in a check room and I've been using it and leaving it in other check rooms ever since. She was, she was just about to give him the money, you see? And she killed him instead. anyone to believe this? I have really no idea. What about it, Inspector? Well, it certainly fits in with the verdict of the trial, sir. It wouldn't do you much good, would it? The trial's over, you'd have to admit you arrested the wrong person. Max, I think you'd better go. You bet I'll go. But you made one mistake, Tony. What will Margo think when she hears about this? She'll deny it, of course. But she might even change her will. Then you'd have done it all for nothing. In Inspector. You really think they'll let him see her? I don't want her upset. Not now. No, no. Of course not. I have a word with her lawyer. He may be able to prevent it. Hmm? And I should get all that money into the bank, if I were you, sir, before somebody pinches it. <laughs> yes, thanks, I will. <clears throat> and then... Um... By the way, I was, um, I was asked to say that uh, there's a few things belonging to Mrs. Wendis in the police station. Well, what sort of things? Oh, it's some books and a handbag, I believe. Uh, they'd like you to come in and collect them sometime. You mean after tomorrow? Yes, yes. Or today, if you like. Just ask for the desk sergeant. He knows all about it. Well, goodbye, Mr. Wendis. I don't suppose we shall meet again. Goodbye, Inspector. Oh, uh, thank you.
Chief Inspector Hubbard here. Give me Sergeant O'Brien, quick. O'Brien, I've got back in again. You can start the ball rolling. Right. What are you doing back here? I don't believe for one minute that Margot gave him that money. Looking for his bank statement. Never mind about that. You've got to get out of here quick. Not till I find the bank Shots statement. Shots allowed. Listen, Inspector. Shut up! If you want to save Mrs. Wendis, you keep out of this. Let me handle it. You nearly ditched us, then I should have locked you up. Who was that? Writers. Think you know it all, don't you? What the hell's going on? God save me from the gifted amateur. We've got a little surprise for you, Mr. Halliday. Max. Max. What are you... Where's Tony? Gone out. As a matter of fact, we don't know when he'll be back, Mrs. Wenders. Thank you, Thompson. Was that you who rang the bell just then? Yes. Why didn't you let me in? You got a key. Why didn't you use it? I did, but the, it didn't fit the lock. No, you know why, don't you? No, I don't. Can I have your bag, please, Mrs. Wenders? Thank you. Has the lock been changed? You knew this key wasn't your key, didn't you? No, I didn't. Oh, come on, Mrs. Wenders. Your husband has explained this. You can tell us all about it now. What is it? What am I? I don't understand. No. No, I don't believe you do. Come and sit down, Mrs. Wendis. Thompson? Sir! Take this back round to the station. Yes, sir. Wait a minute, you clot. You can't walk down the street like that. Yeah, put it in this. I don't understand myself. Why are you here? I don't know. About an hour ago, they told me I was to be taken home. Two detectives drove me, and they parked just around the corner. A policeman came up and said I could go, but I, I couldn't get the door open. When I left, he was still there, and he brought me around through the garden. Where's Tony? Would you mind telling us what you're up to, Inspector? Mrs. Wendis, what I've got to say may come as a bit of a shock. We strongly suspect that your husband had planned to murder you. What? Sometime after you were arrested, Mrs. Winters, your husband started spending large amounts of money all over the place. I wanted to search this apartment, quite illegally, and find his bank statement. So I got a hold of your handbag in the prison. I stole your key and came over here. All highly irregular, but I was angry. I used your key just as you did now. It wouldn't fit the lock.
Yes, sir. Which way did he go? Down the block, sir. Towards the police station. Good. He's just found out about his raincoat. Yes, he came back and he couldn't get in. I think he's on his way to the station now. Has Thompson arrived with a handbag? Good. Now, listen. Make absolutely certain you give him the books and the handbag. Make doubly sure he sees the key. You better make him sign for everything. If he wants his own key and raincoat, you can tell him I've gone to Glasgow. Yeah, and uh, call me back here the moment he leaves the station. Right. Well, Mr. Halliday, you got it yet? Not quite. Where's Mrs. Wendis' key? Took me half an hour to find it. Why didn't he use it just now? He didn't use it because he doesn't realize it's here. He still thinks it's in his wife's handbag. You see, Mr. Halliday, you were very nearly right. Swan was told where to collect the key and to put it back again out there when he left. But your husband didn't plan on Swan getting killed. So naturally, when he found him lying there, he thought the key would be in his pocket. That was his little mistake. Because Swan picked up the key, he opened the door with it, and then, then, he put it back again out there before he even came into the room. He was out there all along. Yeah, right. He told he must have taken a key from Swan and put it in Margot's handbag. But exactly. And that was Swan's own latch key. Uh, mind you, I didn't guess that at first myself. At first, I thought that your husband must have changed the lock. And then it dawned on me. Is that why you brought me back here? I had to find out if you knew about the key out there. And if I had? Well, you didn't. O'Brien? I see. Then he should be here in a matter of moments. Right. Try to hold on just a little longer. Williams. Yes, sir? He's left the station. Give me a thump when you see him. Right, sir. What happens now? I've pinched Mr. Wendis's own key from his own raincoat. Now, when he comes back, he'll have to try the key from the handbag. And when that doesn't fit, he'll realize his mistake, put two and two together, and look under the stack carpet. And if he doesn't, this is all pure guesswork. We can't prove a thing. That's perfectly true. But once he comes in at that door, we'll know everything. What will you do? Scotland Yard is standing by for my call right now. And Mrs. Wendis? We'll have nothing else to fear.
We've got him. 